Hey, you're here with Dr. Jody, and this is season four of Anxiety. I'm so done with you. This podcast is a teen and a young adult guide to ditching toxic stress and hardwiring your brain for happiness. If you're new here, grab a copy of my book, Anxiety. I'm so done with you because this series goes section by section through the book, going a little bit deeper, giving more examples and telling more stories. In this season, which follows along with chapter four, we are finally focusing on you making peace with yourself because you can't get rid of anxiety when you're still being your own worst critic. And you know what I mean? You have been your own worst critic and you don't deserve that. You deserve kindness, compassion, and forgiveness. And in this season, I'm gonna give you the practical tools on how to do that with yourself. Thank you so much for listening, subscribing, and leaving me five stars on Apple Podcasts. Please spread the word about this book and series because mental health problems have dire consequences that cause more and more pain to young people, their families, and their communities. And I need you to help me turn the tide by sharing these tips for embracing self-love. Welcome to this episode that accompanies chapter four, section four, embrace connection. In this episode, we'll review how and why the mind thinks so much. We'll discuss why humans need connection and I'll double down on why isolation is one of the worst things for your mental health. Humans are social beings and we need connection. This is because during early human history, communities were necessary for survival. We did not have the warmth, speed, strength, claws, or teeth to survive alone in the wild. So to ensure that we stayed together and help each other sustain the species, early humans developed an innate desire to belong. This desire saved us and allowed us to evolve, to use tools, have foresight, and create the world that we have for better or for worse. And also, it is the cause of so much of our suffering because needing to belong encourages our deepest fear. Am I worthy of belonging? Combine this desire to belong with the fact that our brains have that capacity to think 12 to 60,000 thoughts a day. Remember, the brain evolved to solve problems because we had to find food, figure out shelter, take care of our families, and keep ourselves warm. There were so many things to do that our brain had to evolve to have tons of thoughts to get those things done. We don't need that capacity anymore because most of those chores are now built into the structure of our lives. I know it seems like we're busier than ever, but it's a whole different kind of busyness than it used to be. It's not a problem-solving busyness. It's a pressure and high expectation busyness. The type of busyness that we have now makes those thousands of thoughts tumble around each other like our heads are a clothing dryer. They keep going around and around and drain us of our vitality. Even though I covered this in other episodes, I'm going to remind you that you don't merely have more thoughts than you need, but your mind makes up things to use them for which usually takes on a negative flavor. To boot, you make meaning around those thoughts, which compound on the negativity of it all. So for example, you think, why doesn't she like me? But then you make meaning around that by adding, I have to figure out why she doesn't like me and why people don't like me. This, as you probably have guessed, brings up any rejection from your past as you search in your memories for a theme to answer this question. This second and third thought feel like the truth about what you have to do next, as if you have to figure out what ways you are unlikable in order to survive. This, as you could imagine, brings up any rejection from your past as you search your memories for a theme to answer the question, why don't people like me? This is the thing about the human brain. If you are looking for a correlation between two things, Even if it is between two seemingly unrelated things, you will find a correlation. Consequently, this is why people can rationalize blaming themselves for something that has nothing to do with them. The creative ways they connect the responsibility to the event can be compelling, in their mind that is, 
But if they said it out loud, it would not hold the same amount of power. And to another person, their self-assignment of blame would probably seem ridiculous. Now we're getting to why I'm reiterating how and why the human mind thinks so much. A big reason you need people is that being around people gives you a break from the thoughts tumbling around and around in your mind, growing negative meaning. You see, at first, it's just an idea, and then you get into it, and then you build a whole story around it. Because our deepest fear is that we don't belong, a lot of these negative thoughts center around this theme including who thinks what of you, what people know about you, who likes you, why someone rejected you, if you might embarrass yourself, why you can't trust people, why people hurt you, etc., etc. It's like putting a bunch of ropes in the dryer and after a while they're so tangled together that they are hard to distinguish one cord from the other until you take the time to untangle them. And untangling them is more attention on the problem. And you might think, I'm such a mess. No one would want me like this. I better figure this out before I get close to anyone. Mostly that, but there are other reasons why you might isolate yourself too. Like if you feel like you're too dark and you don't want to upset anyone else with your depth of sadness, or you think they'll hate you if they know who you really are. You may feel like you wouldn't be able to stand being hurt by one more person, so you keep to yourself. Sometimes you worry that if you said what you think out loud, it would overwhelm you and you'd fall off some insanity cliff and never be able to regulate yourself again. Also, you might be ashamed by your neediness because you think you shouldn't need anyone and force yourself to suppress it. When you're struggling emotionally, all of these excuses and more make you withdraw from other people. And this is the thing. It is the worst thing that you could do. Because then it's just you and your negative thoughts with no one to distract you. No one to love you up and tell you that you are normal. And you need that last one because this does not feel normal. I know you're looking around and it doesn't seem like anyone else is going through what you are. But that is not true. I understand you think that because people look fine on the outside even when they're struggling on the inside. But when you talk to someone about what you're feeling, you often learn pretty darn quickly that they can relate to everything that you're saying. Also, when you're needy, which is normal, and you're ashamed and suppress it, you only feel needier and then more ashamed and then needier. And from that intense state of neediness, you might just overwhelm someone, especially a young person who doesn't have much experience knowing how to help you. However, When you allow yourself to be needy the first time and reach out to someone, you will feel better and they will too. People love to feel needed and they love when they can make a contribution to somebody else feeling better. There's been some interesting research that says kids who grew up with their grandparents have fewer emotional struggles. If that isn't testimony to the fact that individualistic culture is a problem to our psyche, I don't know what is. The more populated your life is, the better you will feel. In homes with more bodies, there's more communication, storytelling, emotional support, tradition, helping each other, sharing, and problem solving. To humans, doing these things with other people help us feel safe and secure. And the more we engage with others, the more we feel a sense of belonging. Yeah, relationships are messy, but when there are a lot of them, you trust you can handle the messiness when it comes and learn from it. And having a lot of people around you will free you from analyzing every single detail of every interaction because you just can't. If you only had one friend in your life and something happened to that friendship, the devastation would be huge. Without that one person, you'd have zero belonging. And to make matters worse, your body hormonally responds as if you're kicked out of the community and will die out in the wild alone. But if you had 40 or 50 friends and acquaintances, three or four people withdrawing from you because they're busy or distracted one month would feel okay, even if they are being mean. You'll probably notice and you'll wonder about them and you might even feel upset, but you'll be busy with all the other people and activities and there'll be less mind space to perseverate over what happened with those three. You might have heard many people blame phone use for disconnecting people in the last decade or so. There's no doubt that young people have fewer face-to-face interactions as they have more and more screen interactions. But those are not the same. 
Also, phones give people who are insecure something to hide behind while still experiencing relevance. This makes it easier not to push themselves out from behind it. But sometimes people need a break from the stimulation of their phones. Unfortunately, they too often choose isolation for their break rather than in-person hangouts because scrolling through social media makes them sick of people. Another problem is that phones keep people up at night. This is bad because then they sleep away the daytime hours when there's more opportunities to be with people. Mental health usually takes a dark turn when someone's nights and days are switched around. This switch might happen because of strong negative emotions in the first place, but then it makes it so much worse because of the isolation. When I meet someone who doesn't even care if they get better, I know that that person has endured extreme isolation. I know this because nothing fun or pleasurable happens in isolation and dopamine, the neurotransmitter in the brain that releases when we experience pleasure, stops triggering. I mentioned this in season two, but since that was so long ago, I'll review this phenomenon again. When you do something pleasurable, interesting, or fun, you release that feel-good hormone, dopamine. And then you decide to do it again because it feels so good and then get the hit of dopamine again and so on and so on. When you don't do anything good for a while or feel anything good, you stop being interested in doing anything because you've lost knowing what feel good feels like. It's like a dopamine desert. This is a huge reason why the COVID pandemic had such a devastating effect on people. When we were in lockdown, the isolation and lack of stimulation affected our brains. We experienced fewer spreads of dopamine, which eventually feels like exhaustion and lack of motivation. Did you feel like that? This dopamine desert made it hard to feel normal when the world started to open up again. Being social felt unfamiliar too, which brought trepidation. What also made it difficult was not understanding what was happening and thinking that your anxiety and depression meant something was seriously wrong with you. But there was nothing wrong with you. Yes, you were in pain, but it wasn't pathological. Your feelings were a typical human response to the situation, but maybe nobody told you that, and so your monkey mind got to make up why you felt this way. Perhaps you assumed that you lost yourself, that you can't be around people anymore, that you have no friends, that you're awkward, you have no interest, or you had some other negative thoughts similar to those which made you feel significantly worse. The good news is that dopamine returns and starts to function like normal once you get regularly stimulated again. If you are not lost in the worry that something was seriously wrong with you, you may have gone back out around people and the dopamine came back and you started to feel like your old self again. The brain is amazingly adaptable and adjusts quickly. However, if you are a highly isolated person and feel completely unmotivated and don't care if you feel better, I am so glad that you are listening to this podcast. This is urgent. Please tell an adult that you trust what you're feeling. You don't have to do this alone and nobody expects you to do this alone. You need someone to help you get out of the house and do something to get that ball rolling so you can connect with your agency and come back to feeling more like yourself. And once you feel better, it'll be easier to keep engaging in life and continuing to get yourself better. Sometimes isolated people days and nights get switched. Your drive to isolate yourself might have had you longing for quiet. Sleeping during the day is also a way to avoid feeling anxious or depressed. But being up at night with these feelings is way worse. Sometimes people realize that it's a problem and they try to change it back. All too often, they go to bed early in an attempt to adjust themselves. This rarely, if ever, works because you cannot go to sleep if you're not sleepy. You may feel tired, but not sleepy. Plus, you're very vulnerable to that monkey mind lying there, not falling asleep. However, you can force yourself to wake up if you're exhausted. I know, I know it doesn't feel good, but it's only temporary and you can do it. You can wake yourself up, even if it means you'll be sleep deprived for a bit. After a few days of getting up in the morning, you'll naturally begin to fall asleep earlier at night and you'll catch up on your sleep. This is the only way to do it. You have to wake up early first. 
People often resist this because you are already feeling bad and you don't want to make it worse by feeling exhausted and sick when you wake up. But be aware that sleeping can be akin to self-medicating and you can feel addicted to it, which means it might make you feel relieved in the moment, but overall, it'll make you feel powerless. Trust yourself here. It is not dangerous and you could do it. And it should only take a couple days of morning discomfort before you sleep better at night. That investment in something that will make a huge difference to you overall is worth it. Sleeping at night and being awake during the day is a healthier schedule for your body and your mind and your soul. Let's talk about connection now since that's the title of this section, Embrace Connection. Connection is essential to humans, like I said, because we needed a community to survive. We still need a community to survive and thrive. But we also need it because we see and know our own selves through the reflection of the people around us, meaning that you only experience yourself when you are in a relationship. If you are in a vacuum or isolation, you have a much more fragile sense of self that came from some leftover sentiment from a relationship in the past. It is withering on a very thin string and your sense of self withers with it. When you are around people, you see and know yourself reflected back from them. And when you're around uplifting people, you see the good in yourself. And when you're around miserable or abusive people, you feel horrible about yourself. That's why someone who is abusive towards you isolates you from your friends and family. It's because they want their expression of you, which is what they've created to disempower you, be the only you that you see. There are two things that I want you to take away from this episode. One is to fill your life with a diverse community. And the other is to make the ones that you are the closest to good-hearted people. They don't have to be perfect because if they had to be perfect, you wouldn't have anyone around you because no one is perfect. But they have to be well-intentioned, thoughtful, kind, and somewhat insightful so they have awareness of their own limits. Everyone is limited, but that doesn't matter because it's consideration that is crucial in every relationship. You want them at least to have the ability to see the beauty in you and reflect that back so that you could see it too. People want to be relevant. They want to feel a sense of connectedness. Connectedness is a person's perception of belonging. According to attachment theory, social connection is an intrinsic human need. People desire to be personally accepted, included, and respected by others. Particularly in adolescence, this is true because it is a time when you are developing your autonomous identity, making you extra sensitive to belonging. You could experience school connectedness, family connectedness, or connectedness to another group like a sports team or coworkers or a friend group. Researchers found strong correlations between a person's sense of belonging with lower levels of suicide behavior and depression and higher levels of self-esteem. Also, kids who feel school connectedness perform better academically and are less likely to participate in violence, substance misuse, and sexual promiscuity. People also want to matter. It's normal for you to want this for yourself. Mattering means you feel valued by yourself and others and feel that you add value to yourself and others. Humans are social beings, so of course, feeling cared about improves well-being and behavior. It affects how you think about yourself. It increases pro-social behavior, friendship, quality, and life satisfaction, all of which are essential ingredients to robust mental health. Plus, being around nice people can have the immediate effect of making you feel relaxed and happier. And your body biologically feels less vulnerable too. Not only do you feel supported by nice people, but good relationships are mutual. That means they need you too. That gives you a sense of purpose, which is so important that we are going to dive deep into the sense of purpose in chapter five. It may feel vulnerable to be around people because you've been hurt in your past, but it's more vulnerable to be alone. That is a huge trick of anxiety. It convinces you that you need to endure ongoing suffering to protect yourself from some future possibility of suffering. It's BS. You need people because people need people. 
Also, you don't need to be fully vulnerable with everybody. Go back and read section 3-2 or listen to episode 3-2, where I tell you about your ruby slippers. Even small talk with a barista will get you out of your head, which will feel good for a bit. String more interactions together and they will add up to some energy that will help you take another step in peopling your healing journey. I have loads of videos for you that complement these concepts and I put those in the blog post that goes with this episode. Like what to do if you're lonely, anxiety and trust issues, nervous system privilege, red flags, getting rid of intrusive thoughts, what to do if you're needy and setting awesome personal boundaries. The link to the blog post is in the show notes. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Anxiety. I'm so done with you. With me, Dr. Jody. In this episode, you learned how and why the mind thinks so much and how negative thinking is exacerbated by isolation. And you heard why all humans need, 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 need connection. I appreciate your subscribing, commenting, and leaving me five stars on Apple Podcasts. As always, there's a link in the show notes to the blog post for this episode that has the transcription and more resources for healing your brain, body, and spirit. Plus, you can hang out with me on YouTube and TikTok at Dr. Jody. The next episode will cover Chapter 4, Section 5, Embrace a Positive Mental Attitude. Read or listen to that, and I'll see you there.